Okay, then we are going to continue with kind of a short wrap up um, of the first block of the lecture. So the first block was kind of the Kalman filter and all its friends. And the second thing was the next step of the particle filters. That's something we will start with kind of the next step is how to use particle filters for solving the simultaneous localization and mapping problem. And then we look into um, graph-based method at the, last, at the last step. Okay, so Kalman filters. We started with Kalman filters and then the Kalman filter is not the Kalman filter itself, it's kind of the Kalman filter and all its friends. So we looked into the Kalman filter. We haven't really used it for SLAM um, because it had the issue that it assumes that everything is linear, so it's not really that well usable. So that led us to the extended Kalman filter, which linearizes, uh, uses linearized models and um, is one way to deal with these nonlinearities. Then we looked into the unscented Kalman filter, um, which use the unsented transform to get a better approximation of the uh, linearized functions. And then we looked into the extended information filter briefly and then did the sparse extended information filter to a very much deeper extent. And these are kind of the most important representatives of the um, techniques from the Kalman filter family that have been used for the SLAM algorithm. So the Kalman filter, just a very, very short wrap up consists, as all others, of two steps, the prediction step and the correction step. And this was the very simple setup where we only have a linear dependency to go from the previous mean to the predicted mean and then update our predicted covariance matrix accordingly. Then we had computed the Kalman gain, which was a trade-off between um, how certain am I about the predicted estimate of the robots pose and how much certain am I about the, the measurement. It's kind of a weighted, a weighted mean between the observation and the prediction. And this leads then to, and that's also why it's called correction step, because it uses the observation to correct the prediction. This kind of the standard Kalman filter. And that's an algorithm you should know. It's kind of really one of the basic algorithms. You should have really understood that algorithm. If not, it would be kind of a pity. Um, well, then I may have failed, um, because we spent some, quite some time with it, so I hope you all are aware of what the Kalman filter does. Um, the problem we have with the Kalman filter is that it is um, as linear models. So whenever the world becomes nonlinear, um, we are going to fail. And then we said, OK, let's replace those linear functions by nonlinear functions. The problem is in, in order to still execute the Kalman filter framework, or the extended Kalman filter framework, we need to have linear functions. Otherwise, it simply won't work. So the trick is to linearize those functions at the current linearization point at the last best estimate that we had, and then um, approximate with the Taylor expansion. And this then led us to the extended Kalman filter, <coughs> which is very similar to the Kalman filter, except that um, it uses this nonlinear function g and nonlinear function h in order to compute the motion update and the predicted observation and the measurement function um, to come up with um, kind of to replace the linear models of the Kalman filter. So the Kalman filter is an, uh, the extended Kalman filter is an extension of the standard Kalman filter. And um, it's kind of, let's call it a trick that is applied in order to deal with those nonlinear functions, just linearizing them at the current best guess. And this is an approach which is very frequently used, it's probably the most frequently used SLAM implementation, although there are not that many new coming up. So Today, most people use other techniques, but this is kind of traditionally the SLIME approach um, with which everything started. And it works well as long as your nonlinearities are not too bad and unless your uncertainty is not too huge. So huge uncertainties combined with nonlinearities, um, that's something which may screw up your system or your filter. If you want to use it for SLAM, we have, this is our typical state vector. So we have the robot's pose and the position of the landmarks. And this gives us the corresponding covariance matrix. And then we can actually, if we start an estimate that the robot sees the first landmark, this will give me the corresponding correlation matrix. So the robot's pose here is correlated with the position of the landmark. So you can actually see those small dots over here. As we continue to ride through the environment, map the scene, continue and continue, we get this um, kind of dense covariance matrix 
or correlation matrix, just a normalized variant of the other one. Um, so we can see this kind of checkerboard pattern, um, which tells us that all the X positions are correlated and all the Y positions are correlated of the landmarks. It can actually be shown that in the limit, all the landmarks get actually full, the landmark estimates get fully, fully correlated. So if we continue driving around, we have this uh, full correlation, so the matrix becomes dense. This, the SLAM algorithm, the complexity of the SLAM algorithm itself um, is dominated by the number of landmarks that we have. So it's quadratic in the number of landmarks and it's quadratic memory consumption. Um, this only holds here for the SLAM case because in the SLAM case I again have the effect that I see only a limited number of features and I also have the case that I um, update only a small fraction of the state. Otherwise, the operations are more costly. So I only can do it in quadratic time, in quadra uh, quadratic time because of the properties of SLAM. But still, even with the quadratic complexity, the, uh, the EKF can become intractable um, if we look into large-scale mapping. Our environment is simply big. We have a lot of features. This doesn't really scale well. Then we looked into the unsettled Kalman filter, which was one um, technique in order to uh, improve the linearization of the EKF. So not just to take the current linearization point to compute, uh, the current best guess to, as a linearization point to do our linear approximation, but to use multiple points. And this was the unsettled transform, the sigma points take more than just the mean propagate it through the nonlinear function and then reconstruct the Gaussian distribution based on that. And use this for, um, um, for the motion update as well as for the um, correction step. That's something you probably are currently have on your, should have on your homework assignments um, to work on exactly that. So exactly we use the unsented transform which then led to the unsented common filter Again, just as a small summary, so this is what the EKF does. We have one linearization point, it computes the linear function and propagates um, the motion update through this um, linearized function. What the unsettled transform does, it computes these sigma points, the so-called sigma points, and propagates those sigma points and then reconstructs a Gaussian based on these um, sigma points. If you compare the UKF with the EKF, um, so they give us the same result for linear models. So if everything is linear, I don't lose anything in doing that. Um, it's a better approximation than the EKF for nonlinear models, so I gain something. Although it's reported in a lot of applications that the, the improvement is somewhat small, so it doesn't make a traumatic difference. You can use this to tune your algorithm, but the effect is not traumatic. Um, and another advantage is that um, you don't need to compute Jacobians for the UKF, so if you're too lazy to compute your Jacobians, you may use the UKF. Um, although there may be other things on how to compute the square root, how to do that, which can lead to other, whatever, numerical, may, may lead to numerical problems. Um, it's somewhat slower, slightly slower than the EKF, but still in the same complexity class, because the sampling process is simply a little bit more, it's a constant overhead, but same complexity class, just a little bit more expensive to compute. And then we had the um, extended information filter, which is the doing, performing next or running an extended common filter, not in the moment representation using a mean and a covariance matrix, but do that in the canonical form where we use the information matrix and the information vector um, in order to do that. The, um, the thing is that what was cheap in the Extended common filter becomes expensive in the information, extended information filter and the other way around. And something which is still um, a little bit you know, suboptimal that I still need to compute the mean typically for doing the motion update and doing the measurement update. So I still need to compute the mean. Um, so the EKF and the EIF have in the end the same expressiveness. So um, there are two steps. One is more expensive, the other one is cheaper. Depending on what I exactly do, I may choose one or the other. Um, but much more often the EKF is used and um, they both have the same expressiveness in their operations. 
Um, yeah, that's exactly what I already said before. Um, same complexity glass. The one is more efficient the other one. In this case, the other one, the other case. Um, that's basically it. Um, uh, but using the information form was served as one uh, motivation to look into the sparse extended information filter, um, which we just discussed today. Um, where, because if we look into the covariance matrix, we see the information matrix is approximately sparse. So the key trick is to get rid of those direct links or a large number of those direct links to get an obtain an approximation and then solve this approximation. We have these four steps, the motion update, the measurement update, the recovery of the mean, and the sparsification, which we just discussed a few minutes ago. So um, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but the uh, most important things is that we only maintain um, links between the robot and a small number of landmarks, these active landmarks, and um, we, as we only keep a constant number of direct links between the robot's pose and active landmarks, um, when the robot is moving, the, those landmarks get um, obtained or have increased uh, direct links or links of increased strength. But um, since the number of active features is limited, the number of links that are generated in this way is also limited. In this case, I maintain a sparse um, matrix. And then we can exploit this sparsity information in all um, our steps. So um, the size lamp is an approximation. Um, as we said before, it's the, the quality of the solution is worse, but I can compute it much faster and need, need less memory in order to maintain that. And these are the big advantages of the um, sparse extended information filter for SLAM um, compared to EKF SLAM, for example. Okay, so the um, Kalman filter and all its uh, families are different ways for representing and updating Gaussian distributions based on motion updates and based on measurement that I have. And depending on what kind of models I have, are they linear or are they nonlinear, I can choose one or the other, um, or what properties exactly the algorithm requires from the problem that I'm trying to solve. Um, but all filters which have been presented so far in this course require or assume a Gaussian distribution. So whatever it is, it will be represented by a Gaussian. If it is a Gaussian or not, the filter doesn't care, just says Gaussian, that's it. Um, that is a limitation. That is especially a limitation if you, let's say, say I'm either here or there. I, I'm pretty sure I can be nowhere else, but here or here are simply two possible locations of the robot which I can't distinguish. Because the environment, let's say, I have a symmetric environment, and two rooms look exactly the same. So I say I either in room A or in room B, the room looks identically. I'm pretty sure I'm either in A or B. I'm pretty sure I'm nowhere else, but those two modes are far away. So it's no good way to represent it with the Gaussian distribution. And that's one of the disadvantages of those systems here, especially if there's a high uncertainty, if there are ambiguities in data association, um, which then can lead to this multimodal distribution or bimodal distribution, distributions. And you can actually show that a certain number of situations doesn't happen that often, but in most real data, data, uh, data sets that you see, which are recorded with the real robot, you have a certain number of situations, let's say up to 5%, where uh, the distribution is non-Gaussian. Still, in most cases, the Gaussian approximation is not too bad, but in a few cases, it's dramatically wrong, and then those filters will typically diverge and will not work in those data sets. And what we are going into next week is um, particle filtering, which is an alternative technique in order to, um, to address state estimation with a recursive-based filter. So I don't want to go into the details today, but I just want to give you a, a very, very short lookout in what you uh, will experience next time. So we are moving away from having uh, a parameterized distribution model, like our Gaussian, where we say we have a mean and a covariance matrix in order to represent it. And we'll look into what is called a non-parametric way for representing distributions. And the way the particle filter does it, it uses so-called random samples. The best thing to view a random sample is to view it as one possible state the system might be in. 
It's just one hypothesis. You say, I need to cover a certain, uh, an uncertainty that, let's say, the robot is either here or here or there or there. I can say, OK, I have a lot of samples somewhere here, a lot of samples somewhere here, and a lot of samples somewhere there and somewhere there. And those samples represent possible states the system might be in. <coughs> and there's one way to represent a probability distribution without having to write it down in a parametric form. Just have samples. Of course, the larger the uncertainty is that I need to cover, the larger my number of samples that I need. So there's no free lunch. But if I just want to maintain, let's say, a small, uh, not too large areas with my uncertainty, or I have um, situations where, especially the dimensionality of my problem is not too big, that's a pretty attractive way of performing state estimation outside the Gaussian world. And what we are um, going to do next week is to have a very, very brief uh, summary of particle filters. How do they work? What the key assumption? What the key algorithm? Um, and see how this, just as an example, how this works in localization. So we know what the environment looks like. And then we will do something which is called Monte Carlo localization, but really just in, let's say, half an hour. Just want to give a very quick tour through Monte Carlo localization. Uh, which is kind of a simplified form, and you can nicely see the properties of the particle filter algorithm. And what we're then going to do is, okay, given that we know how localization works with a particle filter, how can we actually do SLAM with a particle filter? And there are a number of challenges that we need to address. The key, challenges, key challenge is the high dimensionality of our estimation problem. So the robots pose is low dimensional, three dimensional, that's kind of easier, six dimensional. But if I have a million of landmarks, that gives me easily, uh, whatever, more than two-dimensional state space. And that's something what particle filters cannot handle well. Because you can see that you need to have enough samples to cover, let's say, the meaningful areas or regions in our state space. And that's, in these situations, if you have hundreds of thousands of dimensions, they typically flaw because you can't represent so many samples. But there will be tricks on how we're going to address that and solve that issue so that we can use the particle filter and exploit the nice property that we can represent multimodal distributions with that. Again, the key idea of the particle filter is I have a large number of possible hypotheses, so-called samples, in which the system might be in. And if you want to compute, let's say, what's the probability that the robot is in a certain area, you inspect this area and simply count the number of samples in that area. And the more samples are in this area, the higher the likelihood of that area, or the probability of that area. That's kind of the basic, the basic of particle filtering. And the nice thing is whenever you do a motion update, <coughs> you just need to update all the individual particles. So you can have crazy nonlinear functions because you only need to um, propagate one single state. And that's great. So you can propagate all samples forward if there's some weird zigzag motion or whatever you do. Every particle can be propagated <coughs> through this nonlinear function very, very easily, and you get your update. You still need to see how can I increase the uncertainty that results from this motion, but that's one very, very attractive way to um, deal with nonlinear motion models. And um, then you need to do a correction step, very similar to the... Um, to the filters before where we take into account the observation and say, okay, how well does this, this particle, this state hypothesis actually represent the world? How well is this in line what the world looks like? And this then assigns something like an importance weight or fitness value if you, if you want to be a little bit more imprecise to every particle. And then in the end you do a kind of survival of the fittest where you eliminate the ones which perform badly and replicate those which perform well. This happens in a mathematically sound way, so not just like, oh, we replicate this one, this one. There's a sound way for doing that, but it can be viewed or understood in this way. It may be easier to grasp. But you say, you have those samples, you propagate those samples, and you weigh them how well they performed, and you kill some of the bad ones and replicate some of the good ones, um, and then you get a new belief in this way, recursively update the belief so that you hope that all samples in the um, areas which tend towards zero probably will die out, and all those which are close to the true suppose will actually survive. It's kind of a very, very, very informal description of the particle filter. And, but that's something we are going to experience next week in more detail. And 
We are done with the first block of lecture. Thank you very much for all your attention and see you next week. Thanks. Thank you.